people of God. Join us at My Father's House for upcoming special services with our guest minister. If you join us in person, we are located at 5712 Bass Road, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Or if you're not local, find us on Facebook and YouTube under My Father's House Fort Wayne to watch the live stream. Please help us to share this video and we hope to see you there. It is by your blood, Lord God, that we are alive. Jesus, you came to earth and you showed us the way, Father God. You showed us the perfect path laid out for us to follow, Lord Jesus. And you took it all to the grave for us, God. So we didn't have to pay the price, Lord. You did it for us. Hallelujah, Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords, we praise you, Lord. Koro toto kerete e, moto karate e te polo koko la tata, proto koro hoto kola te e te. Open our eyes, Lord, as we praise you and worship you, Lord. Take us into the deeper, sweet places of your presence, Father God. Lest we never flounder, lest we never walk alone. We thank you, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory is yours now and forever, forever and ever. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. King Jesus. King Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right. You can be seated. Thank you, Lord. So I have an assistant today. Some of you may be familiar with, and if you're not familiar, feel free to ask me about him later, if you're curious. So good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. So last week, I shared a rather dramatic story about an experience that I had uh, when I was 21 and involved some moose hunting, a compass that may or may not have been broken, and a very foolish kid. So... Long story short, I thought my compass was broken, and I put the trust in myself rather than my compass to get through the forest in Canada, in Saskatchewan, and uh, needless to say, I wandered for about six hours uh, on my own, and I didn't need to. So, I wore the compass today, so you to see. It does work. I promised my dad I would tell you guys it did work. It was me. It was all me. And... Um, I got that compass 20 years ago from my dad. So as you know, a compass is a critical navigational tool. So my dad, before I went into the woods, told me to go north and to use the compass. To always trust on the compass. If I got turned around, pull it out, go north. All right, the instructions, that's really simple, right? Basically a sentence, look at your compass and go north. But I didn't follow those instructions and I paid a heavy price. So getting lost was 100% avoidable. All I had to do was use the tool that was given to me and trust it. So Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So when we lean on our own understanding, we don't get very far. If we do get really far, it's going in a circle in the wrong direction. It's just a waste of time. So when you think you have it all figured out and make a plan of action, 
it's really important that you include your partner, who's the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're going to just be wandering lost in the forest for what? For nothing. So when we trust in the Lord with all of our heart, we're actively including him on our journey. And that's really important. It's like pulling out your compass and knowing with certainty which way you need to go. There's absolutely no guessing needed. The Lord will tell you directly and clearly. So acknowledge him, talk to him, include him in your decisions, include him in your life every single day. Pull out your compass and pray. Don't wander around in the wilderness aimlessly, leaning on your own understanding. If you want to walk a straight path, it's easy, but you can't do it alone. you got to use your compass. So why would you want to work hard when you can work? What's the expression? Don't work harder, work smarter. So with your compass, that's precisely what you can do. You can work smarter. Partner with the Holy Spirit. I promise you it's so much easier. So just as a compass allows the pin to spin freely, so God allows us to spin freely as well, granting us the freedom of choice. Just as the compass will, allow, will always point north, so God's spirit will always point us towards the truth. The way towards truth is such a long and arduous road sometimes because we don't trust our compass. Psalms 43 verses 3 to 4 says, Give me your lantern and compass. Give me a map so I can find my way to the sacred mountain, to the place of your presence, to enter the place of worship. Meet my exuberant God. Sing my thanks with a harp. Magnificent God, my God. Now, if that verse doesn't make you want to run to your prayer closet and get in his presence, I don't know what will. Come on now, you guys. God is so good. It really isn't hard. God makes it so, so simple for us. Ask for the Father's map. He'll provide a compass and a lantern that's going to light your path. Then all you have to do is trust and take that first step. Don't look backwards. There's no point looking at your past and being like, oh, my path was so crooked. I got off the path a bunch of times. Oh, I can see all the things that happened. No. When you're committed to going forward, you go forward. You do not look backwards. You just keep your eyes on Jesus, compass in hand, and walk towards him. He's going to show you the way. He always does. So if you're feeling lost today, like you're walking in circles in the wilderness, just ask the Lord to be your compass and to be your guide. He is faithful and he will always steer you right. And by all means, learn from my mistake and trust in your compass. Trust the Lord Jesus. His plan for your life is beautiful. It's perfect. There's no one else who can do the things that you can do with Christ in you. You're important and valuable to the kingdom. Look to him always. Trust him and go north. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. So, Father God, we just thank you that you will never steer us astray, Lord. You have a purpose and a plan for each of us, Father God. On our paths, we work st walk straight. We walk towards you, Lord. We want to work in your glory, Father God. We want to be focused on the kingdom, Lord Jesus. And there's absolutely nothing we need to turn around and look back towards God. We are seeking your face, Lord God. We want to be in your presence, Lord. Equip us with a compass, Lord. Help us to know to trust it, Father God, because your plans and your ways are perfect. Thank you, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, now we have a video message from Pastor Israel. Shalom from Israel and biblical Emmaus. It's a biblical place, but I want to share with you another part of Israeli story, story of crusaders. We are at the place of called Latrun. It's right next to biblical Emmaus, and it was stronghold for crusaders for a long time, for a couple hundred years. And there is an interesting story. I will tell you a story that will blow your mind, because this story reminds us spiritual warfare and the reality of uh, God's power, angels, and demonic powers. So there is a group of people who came here in the uh, 60s uh, from Europe, Christians, and they came and they got permission to restore this place and uh, build here a spiritual center of prayer since it is crusader ruins. Uh, so people came here, brothers came here, and they 
Local Arabs around told them, this place is cursed. Be careful, don't do a, a thing there. It's, it's a cursed, cursed place. But of course, as Christians, believers, they ignore it. They say, whatever. Uh, so one of the nights, first nights, they just started to work on this place and they were sitting next to the fire and they have heard steps. Jin, 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 like someone uh, dressed in metal walking. They turn around and they see crusader passing on. They literally have seen crusader, like a physical crusader. And of course, we live in the modern time, there is no crusaders. And then another time they hear steps, boom, boom, another, another crusader come. One dressed in French style, another looks like a, a British crusader. So it was very interesting. And they understood, probably there were lots of bloodshed and lots of different situations why it happened so brothers started to pray and uh, cry upon the Lord and call upon the name of the Lord and in spirit they cleanse this place and situation have changed and now many people many Israeli people, people of Israel, and some even international, not many people know about this place, but the people come, I come here sometimes to pray, to spend time with the Lord, and now this place full of peace, God's shalom, uh, the great place for devotion, highly recommended, but it's interesting, right? Uh, there is a reality of demonic powers, they have seen crusaders walking, or spirits of crusaders walking, but because of prayers, it's all gone, and now the place of darkness, once Cursed place because of bloodshed and all the wars become place of rest and place of shalom. Shabbat shalom, dear friends. Blessings and shalom. Hello, good morning. Uh, before I begin this next step, I just want to say she brought in a touch of game night last night, and I do believe everyone was here, so we can have a little fun. But we were playing a game. I'm just going to bring in a touch. We were playing a game called Would You Rather? And so would you rather read with one eye closed <laughs> or would you rather talk with your teeth clenched? So, you know, arg, and I said I would do that last night. But that was a lot of fun. We laughed and laughed and laughed. And so now to be serious, we're going to talk about communion, the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, the sacrament. There are so many names that this uh, sacrament goes by. And Eucharist, which is in Greek, means to give thanks. Communion means communing with God, and it is our Passover remembrance of our new life and freedom from sin. Last night we were communing together and fellowshipping and having fun and, and getting to know each other in, in new ways. And this is the way we commune with God. So in the Old Testament, the Passover commemorated Israel's escape from Egypt. When the blood of the lamb was painted on the door frames, it saved their firstborn sons from death. So this event foreshadowed the work of Jesus on the cross as the spotless lamb of God. His blood would be spilled in order to save his people from the penalty of death by sin. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper on the night of the Passover meal. This was a special Passover meal. Happened to be right when it was time, right? God's got, got it. He knows the timing. So as this was the last meal that Jesus would share with his disciples, he took elements of the Passover meal and made them symbols of his death. Just as Passover celebrated deliverance from slavery into Egypt, so the Lord's Supper celebrates deliverance from sin by Christ's death. Hallelujah. So communion reminds us of the life and work of Jesus Christ, and it marks us as people of his new covenant as we commune with him. As in the word Eucharist, we give thanks as we remember what Christ has done in the covenant with our Father. This also causes us to anticipate the final glorious feast that we will partake in in heaven. The meal serves as a taste of what is to come, a taste of true life. So it's so awesome. So let's see. I was asking the Lord what order to put this in. Let me just read from, from uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and, and just talk about the importance of what we should do before we take this. Uh, sacrament. So it starts in 27. It says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to be 
ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So you guys can start passing out the elements. Um, this, this impacted me as a child. I belonged to a denominational church, and I never read those words, but I knew that the sacrament was holy. And we were to examine ourselves and make sure that we were, we were asking God to come in and change us from the sinful to the set free. And it was so impacted on me in my faith over the years uh, that when my children and I went to a different church and the pastor was up front and he was preaching that it was okay for the kids to take communion, I would not let them because that was something that the pastor had to teach them in a two-year class. They had to have two years of training before they could take that, that sacrament that Jesus died for. And I, I just was so strong about that, I... I wouldn't let him take it. So one particular Sunday, happened to be Easter, Resurrection Sunday, um, the altar was covered in decorations, so they passed the elements among the pews. And my six- or seven-year-old daughter, my other kids, thank you, were um, sitting beside me, and my little one was begging me, please, Mom, he said it was for everybody. He said, Jesus died for everyone. He said, Mom, that I can take it. He said so. And I, and I was so in what I thought was right, I would not allow my children to partake in this sacrament. And this brings tears to my eyes even to today, because as the plate was being passed in front of me and I took the bread, and my six, seven-year-old daughter is looking up at me and begging me to please have Jesus in her heart. I couldn't let her because of the religion. And the plate passed, and I put it in my mouth, and I instantly started to bawl because I have the body of Christ in me, and my daughter, who wants it, does not. Isn't that wrong? So then the juice got passed, and, and I took it, and she stopped asking because I told her no. And I was adamant. No, you have to examine yourself. You don't know how to do that. Even though I had told them all about it, it wasn't good enough for me. And so immediately after the church service, I ran to the back door and I said, Pastor, oh my gosh, I just denied my children the sacrament of Jesus Christ. Would you please do something about that? And you know, he was so good. He took them right up to the front and he had them get down at the altar and he explained what mom was trying to say. And he said a prayer, and he, and he invited Jesus into their hearts. And he said, Mom was just trying to do what she thought was right. So it's okay, and he forgave me for that. And my kids got communion that day. And so I'm so grateful, so grateful for that pastor that wasn't stuck in religion to get my children to get that sacrament. So even though we examine ourselves and we make sure that we understand, it's for everyone. It's for everyone. He did it for everyone. You know, and so he came to our house a couple weeks later, and he played a game with them, and it was a memory game, and he used all the titles of, of this meal. He used Eucharist. He used the Holy Sacrament. He used the Lord's Supper. He used communion. And so I'll never forget that. Even though we all have different names for it, it's, it means giving thanks in remembrance, and it means communing with God. In sacrifice that Jesus gave. So we get ready to take the elements here, and it says in 1 Corinthians 11, starting at 25, it says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So go ahead and break that body that was broken for us and partake in this meal. Thank you, Lord, for your body. For me, when this body goes, when this bread goes into my body, it becomes the body of Christ. For me, healing comes, and it's for you too. As you swallow his body, his body, the living word, is inside of you. 
That is what this is for. We're communing with God and we're receiving what Jesus died for, what he sacrificed for. And then it says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So take of his blood shed for you. Thank you, Jesus, that your blood was shed for us. Thank you, Jesus, that it was for everyone, everyone. We thank you, Lord, for whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he is coming back. And he is going to take us to that great feast. And we're going to eat all we can with him, communing with him, sitting with him at the table. So recognize that and be in anticipation. We thank you, Lord, for this sacrament, for the Eucharist, for the Lord's communion, for the Lord's supper, for all the names that people call it, Lord, but thank you for doing it with us. We praise you, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the thanks and strengthen our mortal bodies with this knowledge in us that the living Jesus Christ lives within us through your body and blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you, Tanya. Okay. Praise God. I was in the moment of communion and realized, oh, it's me. Okay, I better get myself up here. Praise God. Today is, um, in addition to it being Communion Sunday, it is First Fruits Sunday. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about what is that? What does that mean? What's first fruits offering? Because there's different types of offerings that we give, right? We know that what our tithe is. Um, first fruits is a different kind of giving, a different kind of offering. So the concept of the first fruits comes from the biblical times when people lived in a farming agricultural society. <clears throat> Harvest time was significant, right? Because that was when the hard work happened, when the farmers um, had poured into their crops all year, and, and then that began to pay off at harvest time. They would reap what they had sowed, right? They were reaping what they sowed. Um, God called his people to bring the first yield or the first fruits uh, from their harvest to him as an offering. We... Um, we see this in Leviticus 23.10. We see it in a lot of places in the word here, but I just picked out a few. Um, Leviticus 23.10 says, well, let's back up to nine. The Lord said to Moses, so these are instructions that the Lord is giving to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land, I am going to give you and, reap its, and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain of the, the first grain that you harvest. And then there's directions. He's to, to wave, wave it and all, um, you know, there's sacrifice and burnt offerings and things like that. So this was to demonstrate the Israelites' obedience and reverence for God. And it also showed um, that they trusted God to provide for them. They were giving the best, the first of, of what they harvested from their, from their crops. The Hebrew word for first fruits is, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, bikurim, and it's translated promise to come. I thought that was really cool. Um, so think about that. The, the first fruits is the promise to come. So they saw the first fruits as an investment into their future because there's a promise to come that's attached with that. So as you give your first fruits offering today, you can know that there is, um, there's a promise to come. That if, they, that if they, or you in this case, bring your first fruits to God, he, that he will bless all that comes afterward. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> we get the good end of the deal. Praise the Lord. Proverbs 
3, 9, and 10 also talk about first fruits. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of, um, of all your produce. Then your barns will be fill- filled with plenty. We got a barn out here, right? <laughs> Who's got a barn? That's your storehouse. That's where you keep Keep things, right? And your vats will be bursting with wine. Praise the Lord, right? So today we bring our first fruits to honor, to obey him, to honor and reverence God for for all that he is to us. Um, So, and we know, like we just said, that there's a promise attached to that, that abundance will come to you because it's what the word says. That's not why we give, but, but there is a promise attached to it. Um, you will be filled with plenty. Your barns will be filled with plenty. Your, va- your vats will be overflowing. Praise the Lord. You will be prospered. <gasps> she said prospered. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> we don't want to be in poverty. That's not what God promised us, right? Praise the Lord. So the motivation for giving first fruits is generosity. It shows God that you're not attached to your money or what, what you receive, what you produce. Um, it shows God that you love him, that you trust him. Um, when you get an increase, for example, like if you get an increase, a raise at your, at your work with your job, um, you would give the difference. This is like practical speaking. Practically speaking here, you would give the difference of what you used to make and what you did make, like the increase one time. Does that make sense? Or if you get, you know, a special gift, you can give the first fruits of, of that. Um, and this shows your gratitude to God for the extra blessing that he's given you. It's an expression of your heart for your love for his, for his word and for who he is in your life. Um, you can go ahead and, is it Sister Pam, is receiving the offering today. Uh, and the way that, you know, pastors have been led to do it here at, at my father's house is that we give our first fruits um, at, at the beginning of the month, and we give that as an offering to our sister church in uh, Ashdod, Israel, which is the voice of Judah, Israel, or Beth Hillel is the, the name of the congregation, right, to bless what is happening there. Um, and the Bible tells us that whoever blesses uh, Israel will be blessed, right? That's a whole nother message, but um, that's what the Bible says. So as she's coming up, let's just um, let's just bless Israel right now. They, um, you know, we got a special request from Albert Vexler, who's part of the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast. While well, he he's the leader of the the founder of the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast, um, and he asked for prayer today for Israel. So let's just bless them for a moment, and then we'll bless our offerings as well. Thank you, Father. We just bless the nation of Israel now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father God, for bringing your shalom peace over that nation. Just a rest, a blanket over them, covering all political and social unrest in Jesus' name. Father, we declare unity in the name of Jesus, that you bring each party in, Father, in unity under your plan, Father God, for the shalom peace of God, where nothing is missing, nothing is broken. We declare blessing over Israel in the name of Jesus. Jesus. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless this special nation that is the apple of your eye, and we thank you for them and what you are doing on the earth through them in the name of Jesus. And Father God, we just bless these tithes and offerings today. Father, we ask your special blessing on everyone who has given Father, that they will that it will be given back to them, that their their barns will be overflowing and their vats will be overflowing. Thank you, Jesus. Bless them to be a blessing to others. And we thank you for, for growing and multiplying these seeds and offerings for the extension of your kingdom. And for it, we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In the name of Jesus, everyone said? Amen. Amen. And let me add mine to it because... It's here somewhere. Praise the Lord. There it is. Be blessed. Grow and multiply. In Jesus' name. Okay. 
And now, I believe, right, is Pastor Harley? Is that correct? I, d- I don't have my sheet. Uh, it's, it's all right. We go with the flow here. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody doing well this morning? It's the day the Lord has made. We'll be glad and rejoice in it. Amen. Amen. Glory to God forever. So this morning I want to speak to you about being protected. Special protection that we have uh, from God. So if you think about, well, well, just first kind of a throwback to the video that we just watched from Pastor Israel. He's talking about the place, we we, we would say Emmaus, he said Emmaus, was a place that was cursed. The Arabs around that area thought the place was cursed because of all the bloodshed and all of the things and because of the little ghosts and the demon spirits that were operating around there. And... uh, The Christians prayed and those kinds of things lifted and now it's become a place of prayer. So if you think about where Christians are, believers, I'm just talking in a broad spectrum. um, I kind of came to the conclusion you can divide people into three camps, more or less. I mean, you probably could you could probably do some variations of this and get more than three, but here's three simple camps that people kind of place their belief system on. The, the, the first group, they don't even believe there is a devil. Maybe they're kind of ignorant of the word or just oblivious to the fact that, you know, there are spirit entities all around us that we're surrounded by the presence of angels, the presence of demons, the presence of uh, spirit in, in the spirit world. People are just oblivious to it and just go on doing their life. And they call themselves Christians, of course, and, you know, maybe it's through nobody ever talked to them, nobody ever taught them, etc., whatever, but they just kind of like poo-poo the devil. They think it's like superstitious if somebody believes in the spirit world, etc., and uh, so they just kind of ignore it. Then there's another group that it's all about the devil. Everything is the devil and there's one behind every bush. And, you know, you have to do all kinds of spiritual warfare against the devil all of the time in order to stay protected, in order to stay free from the results of whatever those demon spirits are doing. So their whole life is like sort of consumed with resisting the devil, fighting the devil, fighting about about demon stuff. Um, And then there's a third group. The third group is more what I would call the watchful, the wary, and the equipped. So they're not oblivious to the, to the devil. They believe there is certainly a devil and demon power and a spirit world surrounding us. But they're wary of his tactics, of his designs, of his plans and purposes for people. And they're equipped to not just fight, but to stand in freedom and be protected from demonic power influencing their lives and hurting them. They're not afraid of the devil, and they don't go looking for devils. But if the devil shows up, they're sure to cast him out, resist him, get rid of him, get it out of here. So um, so it's interesting, if you just kind of look into the Bible, uh, I like to go to the New Testament particularly, when you talk about such a subject, because you see the reality of demonic power all over the New Testament, but especially in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. So in the book of Luke, the fourth chapter, it's the story about Jesus and how he got launched into his ministry. So let's take a look at there. Let's start there with the book. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translations just because it's uh, pretty smooth flowing. It says, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing at all during that time and became very hungry. So it's pretty interesting 
You know, sometimes when we think about that scenario because of the way it's worded in some of the other Gospels, we think that Jesus fasted and prayed 40 days and then the devil showed up and uh, tempted him. But Luke says that he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. So think about it. Um, you know, we've all done, we've gone through like a 21-day fast earlier this year together. Some fasting totally and some fasting various things during that period of time. But depriving ourselves of food so that not to make us more spiritual or anything like that, but to make times, make special times to actually seek God and let God speak to us and be like more spiritually aware uh, because we're not just stuffing our faces and stuffing our food. So I was mar remarking to Pastor Karen, you know, you don't need a pandemic to kill Christians, to kill people. You know, here in America, all you have to do is give us a fork. And we'll kill ourselves, you know. <laughs> but, but, uh, but when we do those kinds of things, uh, you can more or less have an open spirit to spiritual things. Not just good spiritual things, but also demonic spiritual things. Because the devil surely knows what you're doing when you're fasting for spiritual purposes. When you're, when you're coming before God to seek God and to have his presence in your life and to hear his voice. Uh, uh, devils and demons certainly know those kinds of things. And those will be times that they will come after you. They will try to do some stuff to distract you or to get you to quit or, you know, all kinds of things. Put, you know, thoughts zinging through your mind and through your brain and uh, try to discourage you. So you can just imagine that Jesus, you know, the Bible says that he was God, of course. And, uh, and a lot of times, you know, we just think, well, Jesus could do this because he's God. But the reality was is that Jesus laid aside that, that God aspect of his life during his his time here on earth with his disciples he laid that aside and the bible says that he was fully man he was human and so he got hungry when he fasted <laughs> and so when he was tempted by the devil he had to resist those temptations here it says for 40 days it says he ate nothing at that time and was very hungry. So you could imagine if you got hungry after 21 days, you can imagine how hungry you might be after 40 days of fasting. Now, some people live a fasted life. Uh, Brother Hagen used to recommend that people not fast long fast, but that they live a fasted life. And for him, that was just never eating as much as he'd like to eat. Um, uh, that's how I heard him describe it, at least on one occasion. That might not be the totality of his teaching on fasting, but it certainly is, you know, one way to think about it. But here it says, the devil came to him, verse 3, and said to him, if you are the Son of God. Doesn't this kind of sound like the Garden of Eden? <laughs> you know, in the Garden of Eden, he was saying to Adam and Eve, did he really say you shouldn't eat of that tree? So here he comes to him with the same kind of a temptation, something to do with food. And he says, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. So here we see the first of three temptations that are recorded. But we don't know in 40 days, he, he probably didn't do these three over and over and over again because once he got whipped on one of them, he was done, right? <laughs> he tried something else, right? Because he's got a bag of tricks to, you know, to, uh, to get people to, you know, come off of their place of reverence for God, respect for God, and respect for his word. So Jesus simply answered by quoting the scripture, quoting the word of God, because he was a rabbi, he was a Hebrew scholar. We know at age 13 that he argued, or he, he um, I wouldn't say argued, he he presented cases of the law with the scholars and with the religious leaders of his time, and they were amazed at his depth of understanding of Scripture. So um, these young boys going through yeshiva school would have learned large sections of Scripture, 
And you notice that Jesus didn't have to come, you know, go hunt for a scroll somewhere on the mountaintop to find this verse that said, man should not live by bread alone. It was inside of him, right? It was from his heart he spoke what was revelation to him. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What an important instruction. I mean, if you just, um, if you just took this as a standalone from the Bible and, and thought about the, the, the spectrum of your life and you determined to live by just that short sentence in the Bible, wouldn't that be an amazing li way to live? Not living by bread, by food, by things that we need and perceive with our five physical senses, but to live by every word that God has spoken. Wouldn't that be an amazing life? So the brilliance of his answer, in addition to the power and effect that it had to stop the temptation and to shut the mouth of the devil, is an amazing thing, which we should take note of in our own conflict with evil, conflict with demonic power. Then verse 4 says, Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Verse 5, then the devil took him up to and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Uh, now some people think, you know, like, is this fairy tale land, world, whatever, you know, that uh, the, 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 this, this demon being, Satan, could do this. But it says it, he, he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and then said, I will give you the glory of these three kingdoms, of, of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. So sometimes people think, well, he was lying. The devil's a liar. You know, so sometimes you hear people say that, you know, you say, say something. They'll say, well, the devil is a liar. It's true. He is. Jesus said he was a liar and a father of lies, and he was that way from the beginning. Uh, I guess from the beginning of the time that he fell from heaven, he, w he became the father of lies and the chief liar of all liars, and a very good one at that. So, uh, however... One thing you should note here is that Jesus didn't refute his statement. He didn't say, devil, you're wrong. You're a liar. Get out of here. You're just lying. Because evidently, the devil had some power. And if you think about how the dominion of Adam was lost, where did it go? It was lost in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve violated the word of God, violated the command of God, and opened the door for evil and the knowledge of good and evil to overtake their lives. And there they saw their, their own nakedness or inability to repel evil because they lost the glory of God. They lost that natural protection that was around them that protected them from every kind of demonic, authority that might have been loosed. I mean, evidently at this time, Satan was already fallen from heaven with a third of his angels. So the devil could, could have come by some other way than a snake. I mean, he could have sent, you know, his legions of angelic beings who fell with him out of heaven or got kicked out of heaven and attacked them in some other way or tried to attack them in some other way, but they, he wouldn't have been able to get through because the glory of God was was around them. They were clothed with the glory of God. And you can't penetrate that kind of protection. The glory of God is too powerful to penetrate for any human being or any demonic entity or any angelic can, uh, cannot stand before the glory of God. You remember when Moses went up to the mountaintop, God gave him some specific instructions about the people. He said, don't let them come near the mountain and don't let any animals come either you know, because they will die when they come into the glory of God. Yet Moses was shielded from that. And when he would come down from the mountain, he would be 
semi-clothed with the glory of God because people couldn't look at his face. He was shining. He was literally shining with the glory of God. And people were, re were, were repelled. They, he had to wear a veil so that people could even just look at his face. I mean, it's, sometimes it's a little hard to, you know, let our, I guess, imagination, do you want to say, to imagine, you know, that kind of presence of God in a, on a physical being, you know, that he could come down from that place of being face to face with God and still live, for one thing. And secondly, then, what kind of an effect that would have on people. You know, when the presence of God comes into a place in a special way, many times we can feel the effect of the presence of God. You know, somebody this morning was talking about the river uh, flowing in this place and, you know, being touched by the power and the presence of God. And, uh, you know, this is not stuff that you can manufacture and make kind of just imagine to help hope it happens you know, when the presence of God is there, there's some magnificent things happen. And so it's hard when we try to come to grips with these kind of things that are, are spiritual yet can invade our physical uh, 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 space, our sphere of, our physical uh, sphere. Praise the Lord. Sometimes it's even hard just to kind of talk about that. You just have to talk in tongues. You understand now? Right, hallelujah. So, uh, anyway, then it says, uh, well, the point is, Jesus didn't refute him. He didn't say to him, you, you lying spirit, get out of here. Um, he said he could give all these things to Jesus. Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and, and serve only him. Now, that, was, that scripture was... Um, you know, was like from the times of the commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and um, you shall worship only the Lord your God, not any kind of other gods that were around them or that that were around them with the, the heathen people who were worshiping other gods. So those other gods that the people were worshiping were demon gods, basically. Uh, they were... That those gods were statues, of course, but behind the statues, or in, in, somehow mixed in with the statues and the things that they were bowing down and worshiping and offering sacrifices to, there were demon spirits in, in full operation. Uh, we know from both history and from the Bible that they even had gender bender demons and gods operating. In fact, the the famous Queen Jezebel. Her father was the king of the area that had the chief gender bender god, the one that they actually did uh, like transgender surgeries and things like that uh, to change men to women and women to men in those days even. So if you think that what's going on here in the U.S. and other countries is something new, it's been around for a long time and it's... It's, uh, it's, it, it's put into operation by demonic forces who are coming against the, the things that God has set uh, as principle from his word and as uh, the, um, the guidelines and the rule for humankind to live by. So anyway, he says here, um, uh, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. In other words, don't serve any demon gods. I'm not serving you. I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to bow down to you. Praise the Lord. So you might, you might think of the confrontation that the three Hebrew servants had with King Nebuchadnezzar when they said, you know, our God could deliver us from this fiery furnace, but we want you to know something, you know, uh, we're not going to bow down to you. We are not going to worship you. And our God could save us, but even if he didn't, we're not going to bow down. And if you don't bow, you're not going to burn. <laughs> Amen? So Jesus is teaching us how to resist the devil, how to, how to deal with demonic temptation and demonic uh, presence. You deal with it according to the word of God. He said the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God him only serve. 
Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will give his angels to, uh, to protect, he will order his angels to protect you and guard you, and they will hold you up in their, with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. So it's interesting that the devil knows the Bible. Probably knows the Bible better than most Christians know the Bible which is an unfortunate thing, you know, because we should know the Word of God better than the devil knows the Word of God. But he's using it not in a right way, he's using it in a wrong way. So this is all part of the deception aspect. You know, Jesus said the devil is a liar and the father of lies. So he uses scripture, he uses it deceptively. So sometimes people think they hear God, but they're actually hearing the devil because they think it's God because they, it, it's some kind of scripture somebody has pulled out of context or some demon force has pulled out of context and they're using this scripture to prove some kind of point that they cannot prove because it's not true. It's, it's maybe a partial truth or it's maybe a perverted, uh, a, a scripture that's perverted to mean something else. Uh, for, for example, in our day, you know, there are some churches that believe that that homosexual homosexuality is okay. So we might be muted or something here soon, but uh, they think it's okay. But, you know, obviously, if you read Romans chapter 1, you find out it's not okay, right? Because it's pretty, pretty clear in there um, about that. And also, if you read in the Old Testament, you know, what God has to say about it, and you read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you can figure out for yourself that it's not okay. But... And sometimes they teach like, um, like Jesus was a homosexual because he had a disciple whom he loved. His name was John. And John leaned over on his breast at the communion service or the Passover service, Passover celebration, and so forth and so on. They use things like that to prove uh, items like that. Or they use David loved Jonathan, Jonathan loved David, and so forth and so on uh, in a wrong way to promote their agenda. So, the devil here uh, comes to Jesus and he says, you know, God says that he'll order his angels to guard you, so just jump. But Jesus responded, the scriptures also say. So, he gets hit with the word once, he gets hit with the word twice, he gets hit with the word the third time, he said, scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. Or some translations say, for a more opportune time. Okay, so you said, well, why did you read that story? Well, because I want you to see that Jesus, who was the Son of God, is the Son of God suffered as a human being temptation just like you or me would suffer and successfully and effectively defeated all attempts to dissuade him from his relationship with his father, to divide him, to separate him from his relationship with his father, to contaminate him so that he could not be the, sa the son of God who was also the savior of the world. Um, he fought him tooth and toenail, so to speak, every day of his ministry and stirred up things against him in his ministry and so forth and so on to try to, to take him off the track, to take him off of God's will, to get him out of God's will, to get him in some other agenda. He appealed to his humanness, to the human side of him and attacked the human side of him to get him off of his spiritual side. So... You should take, take it to heart that Jesus said, you know, if this kind of stuff happened to me, guess what's going to happen to you? Amen? Amen? He says what happens to the master happens to those that follow him. So we shouldn't think it unusual if we're tempted. We shouldn't think it unusual if the devil tries to do stuff in our lives or manifest himself in certain ways in order to attack us. But neither do we have to be afraid of any of those kind of things because you see here in Jesus, you don't see any fear, right? He wasn't cowering from the devil when the devil 
appeared to him maybe in a physical manifestation. I don't know exactly how this happened. It doesn't say, but it does clearly say who was there. Jesus was there, the devil was there. And he had a voice, and he spoke, and Jesus understood what he said. And it was a real temptation. Because the Word of God says that he was tempted in every manner that you and I would be tempted. So in those 40 days, there might have been dozens of other kinds of temptation. Heaven knows what the devil could have done. I mean, they picked these three to illustrate some things, which are some interesting things, which we could probably launch into and talk to, but I don't want to do that here at this moment. So... His launch, this was his launch into the ministry. Remember, he had just been baptized by John. The Holy Spirit had just descended upon him like a dove. John saw this in a kind of a physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit coming over Jesus. And he said, and he heard the voice of God that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him, listen to him. And John after that said, you know, I must decrease and he must increase. And so he lost a bunch of followers because people began to follow Jesus and leave John. That's not an easy place for a preacher to be, you know, losing people. You know, don't like, we don't like losing people. We like gaining people. We don't like losing people. But it's, it's, it happens, you know. People, people come and people go because people are people, right? So we can complain and grumble and be angry about it and... God will just say, well, look at John. He didn't bother him any. He just said, follow him. I must decrease, he must increase. So um, sometimes we don't understand things like that. But it's reality. And you have to deal with things like that. Praise the Lord. So this is his launch into ministry. His next, step, his next stop was his hometown Nazareth in the synagogue. He went there to preach. Or he went there to be with, to, to worship with his others. And guess who showed up in the synagogue? Murder demons. <laughs> wow. Talk about more opportune time. Just have the devil show up at church, you know. It's like, okay, I'll go to church. There won't be any demons there. Sure enough, first time, devil there. Throughout his ministry, Jesus went about teaching and preaching and healing. And those demons, they found him everywhere. They followed him around. Although he never went looking for them. You know, years ago when I was with, uh, with Dr. Sumrall, we used to have a guest speaker who would come. His name was Norval Hayes. I think he's passed away and gone to heaven by now. But Norval Hayes had a, was known for casting out devils. And it, uh, in those years, those first years that I was with uh, Dr. Sumrall, I was part of the ushers team. I was a captain of one of the usher teams. And um, when we had guest speakers, usually there was a bigger crowd, and so all of us were on duty. And uh, it seemed like when Norval Hayes showed up, all the demons from 50 miles around showed up too. <laughs> because every baby in the place would be crying, and... People would be manifesting demonic stuff. We had one guy that used to take his little New Testament and he would shake it, look really mean. He would shake it when, when he was agitated by demonic things. And when he'd get out of the institution, he, he used to wander around the building. Sometimes he would find ways into the basement and leave uh, death uh, threats against the Summerall family and things like that uh, down there in the, in the basement. So uh, as an usher's team, we were... We were supposed to be on the lookout for this guy and others like him during these moments. So in this one particular service, Norval Hayes was the speaker, and I was kind of up there by where the speaker's platform was, and I'm looking back, and I was in charge of the ushers that night, and I see this guy, and I think, oh my goodness, he showed up tonight. <laughs> we have plenty to do tonight, and he showed up. So we get partway into the service and he pulls out his little New Testament and he's shaking it real mean like. So we seated one usher on each end of the bench, the pew. This, this church was a round church and it had pews all around. And so we, we thought, we'll, we'll be safe. We'll set one 
washer on each each side. So this guy was sort of towards the middle, you know, about three or four people over from one end. And he's shaking that New Testament. And I, I see this usher on the one end looking at him and glaring at him. And I'm thinking, I think we got more trouble than I thought. <laughs> so this goes on for a little bit and I've radioed to the other usher that was down by that door because there were 17 doors around this this sanctuary, I, I radioed the other usher. I said, you better, you, you better watch that guy and you better watch the usher, <laughs> the usher that's at the end. And I just finished radioing him and the usher on the end that was glaring at the guy shaking the Bible jumped over the five people and started strangling <laughs> the, the guy who was causing the disturbance. So then we had to take both of them out of the service and minister to them. So stuff happens, you know, when you're in church. It can happen, you know. So be prepared, praise the Lord. We live in a time where demonic power is on an uptick and there's a lot of witchcraft and stuff going on. Uh, stuff can happen, even in church. So praise the Lord. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, but we do have authority over them in the name of Jesus. Praise God forever. So anyway, throughout his ministry, this happened to Jesus. You know, they didn't, he didn't go looking for them, but they came looking for him. Some, for some reason, you know, they get just like attracted like a magnet to Jesus. Uh, you know, it might be that there was something in the person who was demon-possessed or demonized or oppressed of the devil. There might have been something in the person that was pulling them towards Jesus. Or it might be people bringing people like this to get set free. I mean, this is, uh, you know... Church should be a place where people get set free. The reason we minister to people in public uh, that have, have demon power going on instead of carrying them out of the service is because every believer should know how to set people free from demon power. The Bible says, These signs shall follow those who believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. So that means you. You're a believer in Jesus. You might think, I don't want to mess with that. You know, I don't want to be... I don't want to be a demon chaser. Well, you don't have to be a demon chaser, but if they show up, you have authority in the name of Jesus. You can cast them out. Jesus has given you that anointing and that calling. He said that he's, he gave his authority to, to his, his disciples to heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, uh, and told them that they should, should give freely from what they had received. Praise the Lord. So throughout his ministry, this happened in the synagogue, and a lot of times in synagogues. In synagogue, there was a man uh, who was possessed by an evil spirit, uh, and an evil spirit cried out. Um, the word also says that he went preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. So it seems like there was a pretty regular occurrence that uh, people that were oppressed by demonic power showed up in the synagogues. Uh, maybe they were just tolerated by others who were leading the, sin the, the services and the worship in the synagogues. Not sure exactly. But when Jesus came, they seemed to be there and he usually dealt with it. But not only there, on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus had to deal with the demonic power. You remember he was asleep in the back of the ship, the back of the boat, and uh, this sudden storm came, such a fierce storm, that his disciples, who were seasoned sailors, thought the boat was going to sink. They said, Jesus, you know, say, Jesus, you know, you're, why are you sleeping back here and we're bailing water? And um, Jesus said, oh, you of little faith, stood up and pointed at the storm and said, peace, be still. And the place was quiet. And uh, then they said, you know, he, this is weird. Even the, sea, even the winds and the seas obey him. So demon power was trying, the, the, the demonic powers were trying to kill Jesus, I guess you could say. I mean, they were at, at, the, at the Nazareth synagogue, they ended up taking him to the cliff and were going to throw him over the cliff. That wasn't just to say, to teach him a lesson, that was to kill him. <laughs> Those were murder demons. Um, the demons that caused that storm were there to sink him, not just to teach him a lesson. Then when he gets across to the other side at the Gadarenes, this guy shows up. This guy that chains wouldn't hold, ropes, strongest ropes wouldn't hold. He'd break the chains and he'd break the ropes. And the Bible says that he, was, he, he claimed to be filled with a legion of demons, 
And it says that nobody went that way because they were afraid of this guy. He was a, like a terrorist. I mean, he was terrorizing that area. He was naked and he would, he would do all these wild things. But he, he, he was drawn towards Jesus because Jesus had been saying, come out of the man. So evidently Jesus spotted him afar off and said, come out of the man. And then he was drawn to Jesus and they had this discussion. It's the only time that we, we know that's recorded at least that Jesus had a c communication with the demon spirits that were in the guy. Because he asked, you know, how many were there and they said legions. So I don't recommend talking to the devil. Just cast him out and get rid of him. Praise the Lord. So, um, so you see that these demon this demonic assignment was against him. Uh, he had told the disciples what to do, that they should heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead. And uh, when they failed, he would step in to help them. For example, the, the young boy that was uh, possessed of the uh, demon or was de de demonized, you might say, had epileptic seizures that was throwing him into the fire and into the water to kill him. And the disciples could not. The Bible says, the father said, they could not cast him out. So Jesus stepped in, said, bring the boy to me. Took care of the business. It looked like the boy died. He picked him up and said, everything's good. When the disciples said, why, why couldn't we do it? He simply said to them, because of your unbelief. And then he said, some come out just by prayer and fasting. So there we see another reason, uh, perhaps for the preparation, you know, being wary, being uh, equipped to take care of business. Praise the Lord. In Acts chapter 10, um, well, just to kind of um, go back just to the other thought about these demonic powers coming after him. Um, he was also plagued by the demon-possessed ultra-Orthodox people that were everywhere that he went. They were trying to trip him up. They were trying to trick him. They were trying to get him to do, make some false steps so that they could accuse him, take away his power, and eventually they had murderous spirits in them that wanted to murder him. Not just him, but Lazarus also, because Lazarus got raised from the dead by him. And many people believed on Jesus because of that. So all of this was happening all of the time, but Jesus still wasn't looking for demons. But when they showed up, he took care of business. So it's a model for us, amen? So we don't have to be afraid of demon power, even though demon power is all around and it's on the uptick and there's witchcraft going on all over the place uh, in our government, in our local government, in our state government, in our federal government, in the nations of the world. Uh, I mean, you all maybe heard about at least or even saw the thing that happened at the Grammys where they were bowing down and worshiping and glorifying demon powers, you know, right on national TV in front of kids and everything, you know. Um, he's getting bolder and more brash in his attempts to affect our culture, to affect our society, to affect our nation. But this is what Peter said about Jesus in Acts 10, verse 38. He said, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So what's, what's the counteraction to, to the demonic power on the rise? Is it spiritual warfare? Because a lot of times, you know, people say, well, we have to be in spiritual warfare. We have to, we have to take up spiritual warfare to, uh, to take care of this. But yet we don't see Jesus in that sense taking up some kind of, uh, some kind of mode of spiritual warfare to come against the devil. He just naturally either used the word of God against him or spoke. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus was not a person of prayer because he was a person of prayer. Jesus went to the mountaintop and prayed, sometimes all night long, the Bible records, right? So he had fellowship with the Father. He had communion with the Father. He had the presence of God in his life. He had the presence of the Holy Spirit manifesting over him. But 
you don't see him encouraging his disciples to do some kind of special ritual called spiritual warfare of some kind in order to counteract what the devil is doing. Now, I, I understand in just using the terminology broadly, um, we understand we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness and wicked spirits. So there is a fight. I, I acknowledge that. I'm not taking anything away from that. So a fight would sort of speak of some kind of thing called, could, could be called or termed spiritual warfare because we're engaged in a, in a battle of sorts or, or at least a wrestling. It, says we, it doesn't say we don't battle against flesh and blood. It says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So there's some pressure, there's some wrestling, there's some contention between the human person and the demonic entities, right? Okay, and that can happen to anybody, right? I mean, you might wake up with nightmares or you could have some kind of a manifestation come into your house or into your room or whatever like that. You can do some things to protect yourself about that, you know. We should pray over your property. You should trust God. You should confess the word of God over yourself, over your family, over your home, over your workplace, over places where demonic aspects you know, demonic stuff is going on, then I suppose in a sense that could be called spiritual warfare, but it should be really kind of just normal Christian life, right? I have a relationship with God. I spend time with God. I read the Word of God. I, I feed myself spiritually. Amen? I want to fellowship with the Father. I want to have His presence in my life. I want to manifest His presence around me, right? Those, are, those should be all things that we do not to repel devils, but to live our life for Christ, right? So that we're prepared to minister to people, worship God and minister to people. Bring the presence of God into the lives of people, right? Does that make sense to you? So I'm, I'm not against, you know, prayer and uh, things like that. But it seems like in our time that some People go to great lengths to make a, a more or less a, like an, a doctrine about something. And, and I understand sometimes you have to do things like that to get people's attention, you know. Like, wake up, there's a devil out there, you know. And he's real. So, I'm not trying to criticize anybody in particular. I'm just saying... Our normal kind of life should be like Jesus' normal kind of life because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, right? Amen. So Jesus lived his life with the greater one dwelling in him. And so when he was, if he was doing spiritual warfare, it was like he woke up in the morning. <laughs> and the devil said, oh my God, he's awake. <laughs> and he's going somewhere today too. And he's going to take some disciples along with him. That's, that's terrible. We've got to stop them. Let's bring some strife to the disciples. Let's put, you know, let's do some, cast kind, some kind of spell on them. And maybe all the witches and the warlocks got together and stayed up till, from midnight till three in the morning and put an assignment against them. They do stuff like that, right? We know they do stuff like that because people who have come out of witchcraft have told us that they do stuff like that. Some have said that 3 o'clock in the morning is their time that they assign demons to go and take out believers. I don't know if it's exactly true and if every, if every coven does that, but evidently there are some that do. Um, but you can just say, well, so what? I'm going to go to sleep. Or if you wake up at 3 in the morning, maybe you should just pray and just say, I have authority here. I have peace in my heart, and peace in my home, peace in my place. I'm protected. I have angels around me. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going back to sleep. Some noted leaders throughout history have said things like when the devil showed up, oh, so it's you. What did they mean? They meant, I have authority. <laughs> Don't cross me. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So, um, again, 
Jesus was a man of prayer. He was equipped and he was always prepared. We don't ever one time see him being caught off guard where he couldn't handle some situation, do we? Can anybody tell me a time when he was unprepared or somehow in some state that he couldn't minister something to someone? I mean, sometimes he ignored people, you know. You kind of get that because people were crowding him, you know. Sometimes the disciples were saying, Jesus, you said somebody touched you. You know, everybody's touching you. That's your, what's the matter with you? Um, that can take its toll on, a, uh, on the human flesh, right? And so sometimes he, annoyed, you know, he ignored people. And went on, but then when he heard the voice of faith cry out, he always responded. Even if it was some heathen woman from some other country that said, my daughter needs you. My daughter needs to be set free. Even the dogs get the crumbs under the table for, for crying out loud, Jesus, help. <laughs> and he helped, amen? So... Praise the Lord. So the Apostle Paul, likewise, was badgered and harassed by demon entities. He said a, a, a messenger of Satan buffeted him. Not buffeted him, buffeted him. <laughs> Amen. He wasn't at the Great Wall or Paradise Restaurant in Auburn. He was buffeted by some demonic messenger that harassed him. This is kind of what he, how he describes his life to this group of Corinthians in, in the church. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. he said, he's talking about others that are ministers. He said, are they servants of Christ? I know that I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder. I have been put in prison more often, been whipped three times without number, and faced with death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and from robbers. I have faced dangers from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I have faced dangers in the cities, in the deserts, and in the seas. I have faced dangers from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and I have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all of this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. So, you know, some of that is not about demonic activity, but some of it is, right? The devil didn't give him his burden for the churches, right? That was something he took on himself. But many of those things were demonically inspired to take him out. And it's no wonder, because who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? It was the Apostle Paul. So maybe you or I aren't of that caliber or that import to the kingdom of God, but the Bible does say that every believer is valuable, right? So when one believer gets taken out, there's a hole in the body, right? We need each other to function. We need each other to function well because collectively we have available to us all the gifts and the ministries of the Holy Spirit to minister to people. So we should be protected and pre prepared to deal with demonic activity in our lives just like Paul was. Because this is what he said. Um, this, is, this is what he said about all of these things. In, in Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 22, it says, And see, now I go, to, I, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me, but none of these things move me. Just think about that for a moment. None of these things move me. 
What does that mean? You can be surrounded by demon power and not have it move you, right? Jesus had all these attacks against, attacks against him, but none of it moved him. He didn't let it take him out. Paul didn't let it take him out. And then he said, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So one of the things that the Apostle Paul did and the thing that his leader Jesus did was he kept the mission in front of him as being the, 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 the foremost thing that filled his thought life and his spiritual life. So instead of thinking about the demons are attacking me, I've got trouble, they've attacked my finances, they're attacking my family, they're doing this, they're doing that, there's demons everywhere doing stuff. He was thinking about the next place that he could minister the gospel, the next person he could reach for Christ, the next place he could proclaim the cross of Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. That was his life. That was his focus. So that was why none of those things moved him. So rather than focusing on spiritual warfare to keep demons away from us, our focus really should be on the mission of God, the mission of the kingdom of God, the mission of Jesus Christ that propels us into the ministry in the world that we live in that's full of demon power. And then if demons come or demons go, it doesn't really matter so much. None of those things will move us. But we'll be prepared and we'll be protected because we have the blood of Jesus. We have the power of Jesus' name, etc., etc. Amen? So the Bible says the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal of the flesh, but they're mighty through God to, uh, to demolish strongholds. So we should be watchful, we should be wary, and we should be equipped, right? Amen? And we should... We should pay attention to how can we be more watchful. We should pay attention to how can we become more wary. In other words, spiritually tuned into the environment, tuned into the situation, tuned into the circumstances that surround us so that we can be prepared to deal with whatever comes out of that, right? And we don't have to worry about fighting devils every day and every night, you know, just trying to get the demons out of my house. But rather on... Where am I with Jesus Christ? And where is his power inside of me? Who am I in Christ? Am I the righteousness of God in Christ? And if I am the righteousness of God in Christ, then the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against me. Amen? So it's part of our protection has to do with our being proactive in the things of the kingdom of God. Being on target with God being on focus with the mission that he's given us. So we all have different callings. You know, not everybody's called to be a, a preacher, evangelist, or, you know, ever in the sense of being behind a pulpit or having some kind of public, uh, public ministry. But we are all called to minister. Amen? Some, some have maybe a greater emphasis on intercession. Some maybe have a greater emphasis on evangelism and so forth and so on. But we're all called and we should all be prepared to do all of those things. Amen? So if he wakes you up at midnight and says, pray, get down on your knees and pray. Do what he says. He's, he's the one in charge. Amen? It isn't the church or it isn't somebody around you that's going to you know, protect you from the devils. Jesus will protect you if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Amen? Praise the Lord. So, um, the Word of God says, aren't they... Not all ministering spirits. This is speaking about the angels, Lord. The angel of the Lord. You know, we say we quote that psalm a lot of times. The angel of the Lord encamps around and about those that fear him and delivers them. So what's the job of angels? The job of angels is to, is to be your protectors, right? To be your guard. Uh, Jesus said that the, 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 the angel of a child was always before the face of the Father. In other words... You have an angel on assignment for your life. So you might think there's demons around you, but you've got an angel, at least one. And he's probably a pretty big dude, you know. Uh, don't want to mess with him, you know. So 
you know, some demons try to do something in your house, just, you know, put your angel on him. Amen? Amen. He's probably looking for something to do if you haven't been kind of, you know, <laughs> helping him get there, you know? <laughs> Praise the Lord. And if you don't want to use it, I'll, I'll use yours. <laughs> you just we'll put him on assignment here. Praise the Lord. So this is what the Word of God says. It says, not, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who shall or will inherit salvation? Question mark. Are they not? What's it talking about? It's talking about the angels. The Bible says they're flames of fire. They're ministering spirits. They're sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. So why wouldn't you have the angels fighting those kind of battles for you? We know that when Daniel inquired of God in Daniel chapter 10 and Gabriel came and brought him a message, Gabriel said, you know, I had some trouble getting to you, but Michael the archangel went and pushed the demonic forces back so I could get to you. So we know that there's some warfare going on, but it isn't you beating the heck out of the devil by getting in an airplane and quoting the word of God or flying over something in military gear, you know, as if some outward kind of thing is going to scare the devil. You already have the armor of God. If you don't have it on, it's your problem. Amen? With your armor, he can only see Jesus. But if you don't have it on, you know, you, sometimes people say, well, because it says, you know, put on the whole armor of God. Every day I should dress myself in the armor of God. My advice was don't take it off. <laughs> I mean, you know, do you, take, do, you, do you shuck the armor when you go to bed at night so that, so that the demons can come in and give you bad dreams? I don't know. Just keep the armor on. Just keep on the helmet of salvation. Be, be a good idea, right? <laughs> Keep on the breastplate of righteousness. Be a good idea, right? Keep keep on the belt of truth. It's it's a, it's a great idea. Keep the sword of the spirit out. It's better than a great idea. It's offensive and it's defensive. Amen. Amen. You're you've got the armor. Just be armed. Stay armed. Use your arms. Deploy your deploy your equipment. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, uh, the word also says Jesus spoiled the principalities and powers, defeated them, and made a public spectacle of them. So, if there's a wrestling going on, it's, a, it's with a defeated army of demon powers, right? Because Jesus whipped the daylights out of them at the cross. The Bible says that if they had known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. <laughs> If they would have known what was coming to him, coming to them because of what he did at the cross, they would have never done it. But he did it. And he did it for you and he did it for me. So we should live in a place of victory over demon power. Never afraid, never ashamed, never cowering. And, and here's just some advice from my heart. You should be speaking more about God and the things of God than you're speaking about the devil and the things of the devil. I mean, if you're, if you're totally focused and consumed on what the devil is doing, it will keep your mind in places where you don't need to be. But if you're totally consumed with the things of God and are ready to use the th things of God to work through your day, you will be equipped, wary, and ready to go. Praise the Lord. He had already given his disciples the authority over the evil spirits to cast them out. And in Ephesians, it says that Jesus has seated us with him in heavenly places. That's a place of authority, right? So instead of seeing yourself attacked by the devil, you should see yourself seated with him in heavenly places, in a place of authority. Amen? So if you focus on those kinds of things, you know, read the, read the first three books of Ephesians. Pray those prayers over yourself and be equipped to deal with stuff that comes up. Then you don't have to worry about what is the devil doing today. He's worried about what you're doing today. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So 
Our weapons of warfare, they're not of the flesh, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to do what? Demolish strongholds. So if there have been strongholds in your life, they're set to be demolished because God said we have weapons of warfare that are mighty. Everybody say, I have a mighty weapon. Actually, I have mighty weapons. I have mighty weapons. So what are those weapons? Number one, the Word of God, just like Jesus had, right? That should be the first and foremost. Uh, secondly, we have the blood of Jesus. Maybe not secondly, you know. I don't know. I, just, these are not necessarily in order is what I'm saying. We have the blood of Jesus. It's powerful. You know, we sing songs. The blood of Jesus has never lost its power. It's true. It hasn't. And when you use the blood of Jesus, the devil is terrified because he cannot stand the blood of Jesus. And demon spirits, sometimes when you're ministering people, if you use the blood of Jesus, they'll cry out and they'll scream because the, the blood hurt them. <laughs> the blood of Jesus hurt them and defeated them. Praise the Lord. We have the name of Jesus. That's no slight thing. That's no small thing. Amen. Amen. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. We have the name of Jesus. We have the prayer of faith. The Bible says the prayer of faith will sa save the sick or heal the sick. The Lord will raise them up. The prayer of faith is powerful. If you don't know what that is, read Mark 11, 23, 24. Pray the prayer of faith over your situation, your circumstance. Release faith instead of crying about what the devil's doing. The power of the Holy Spirit we have. The Bible says you should be endued with power from on high and then you'll be a witness to me in, in Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. These are weapons of your warfare. These are things you can deploy when you feel like you're being oppressed or attacked by demon power. The armor of deliverance, it's in the book of Ephesians. Read about those armor, pieces of armor. Keep those pieces of armor on. The prophetic reality and truth of God's word. The Bible says in the book of Revelations, and they, speaking of believers, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the words of their testimony. Your words are powerful because it's a prophetic word against a demon power. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand, against, stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. So you can say, Oh me, the devil's after me. Uh, so... He's after every believer. This is what the word says. Everybody in the world is experiencing this. You're not some unique kind of thing and it's just all about you. So stand up with the faith of Jesus and uh, he, it doesn't say he is a lion. It says he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone. He's looking for lunch. You might be it. You could be it. But you don't have to be it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Watchful, wary, equipped, and protected. You're protected. You already have the protection. You have the protection of the blood of Jesus. The power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. All this armor that you got on. Don't let the armor weigh you down. You should be able to run and jump a wall. The Bible says, praise the Lord. I know, I'm running overtime already. I'm so I'm going to end here. Uh, in the Old Testament, speaking about Jerusalem, the prophet Zechariah said this, For I, says the Lord, will be to her like a wall of fire around about, and I will be the glory in the midst of her. Just think about that. Jesus says, or, or God says here through prophet Zechariah that he's going to be like a wall of fire round about Jerusalem for protection, right? 
Because Jerusalem, even today, has enemies. And many of the people that live there don't know that God said he would be a wall of fire to protect her. That wall of fire is that same glory of God that protected Adam and Eve. It was the glory of God that was over them that the devil could not penetrate. He couldn't get through. The only way he could get through their, their wall of protection was to deceive them into believing a lie and getting them to give up their dominion. When they gave up their dominion, they lost the glory. When they lost the glory, they found out they were naked. So don't go streaking through life. <laughs> Keep your armor on. The devil thinks it's the glory because it is the glory of God. It's part of his glory manifested over you. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the, the belt of truth. And the mighty shield of faith is quenching every fiery dart that he sends your way. Isn't that protection? So stand fast in the liberty with which Christ has set you free and don't get entangled with the yoke of bondage. How do we get entangled? By getting our thought life and everything else like looking at the wrong thing. When Peter saw the wind and the waves, he began to sink. And when he kept his eyes on Jesus, he could walk on water. So let's walk on water together. Amen. Amen. Let's take our world back for Jesus. And let them see the miracle power of God. Don't come just with words of man's wisdom. Come with a demonstration of the power of God. Let that anointing flow through you and touch and change lives. So amazing the last couple of weeks ago when we were in, in Great Britain and saw all those miracles. People instantly healed just like that. As Pastor Aleandro was ministering to them. Such a great sense of the presence of God. Just boom. You don't have to stay that way. You can be like this. And people just touched by God's power. Such a great life to live. So live it. Don't be worried about the devil. Live the life of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So let's pray. So, Father, I pray for those that are watching online and uh, live stream and those that are maybe listening by podcast. I ask you, Father God, that your presence will come over their lives in a special way, that your anointing will destroy the yokes and lift the burdens, and that your peace, your shalom peace, that passes understanding will keep their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus, that your grace and your peace would be multiplied to them through knowing you, Father, and that they would have great peace because they're taught of you, Lord. I pray, Father God, that their sicknesses would be healed. I release your healing presence over their lives, your anointing to destroy sickness and weakness and infirmity of every kind. I thank you, Father God, for manifesting yourself strong on their behalf and for raising them out of that place, Father, of hurt and pain and raising them to a place where they're seated with you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So thank you, Father, for your strength, your life, and your joy flowing over the airwaves to these, our brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name. And Father, those that are maybe watching that have not accepted Jesus, we thank you, Father God, for ministering the word of God to them. Your gospel, your good news is the power of God to salvation to them if they will believe. So if, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. If you will put your faith and trust in him, like a paratrooper puts his trust in his parachute and just allow Jesus to come into your life and to manifest himself to you, may be real to you, you will have a relationship with God through him. Thank you, Father God, for manifesting that for our friends in Jesus' name. And everybody.